What's up, everybody? Welcome to One Take. I'm Gil. I'm Alun. And this is where we talk about movies, TV shows, sometimes video games, basically all entertainment that we've been consuming, what we thought of it. We talk about entertainment news. Let's get right into it. First off, we recently watched a Marvel film, Spider-Man Far From Home. Alun, what did you think? I thought it was good. I thought it was entertaining. I felt like it didn't have the amount of depth that I, I wanted out of it. Mm-hmm. Maybe it didn't have as high stakes as maybe I wanted. Right. I'm still forming my opinion a little bit. Still sort of processing. Yeah. I thought it was, I thought it was a really fun movie. I j- it didn't feel like one of the most important movies in the Marvel Universe. Mm-hmm. And Spider-Man used to be my favorite superhero. Right. So I kind of hoped there would be more impact from a spider-man movie but uh i mean overall i really enjoyed it yeah i'm kind of in the same boat i i liked it and i've been trying to put my finger on what it is about it that i didn't love and it's hard not to always compare back to the toby Maguire, sam raimi spider-man movies and that always feels like an unfair comparison i always think of those as like spider-man 2 that was the best but I was in middle school when I saw it, so I don't know how much of that's just this nostalgia talking. Um, But earlier today, I was watching Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, and I was loving that movie. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of the problem is that Into the Spider-Verse felt like its own movie. It felt like it had a unique voice, a unique style, and it was all about Spider-Man. Far From Home has the same problem that every other MCU movie has, which is that it felt kind of like Marvel episode 23, right? It felt like it was beholden to the tapestry of the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe. So it was good, but to me, every Marvel movie feels like it has a little bit of a limit to how good it can actually be. Yeah, and also, you can tell they tried to separate it a little bit, try to give it its own voice, Mm -hmm. the way they, and this is in the trailer, the way they kind of explain that all the other superheroes are busy or unavailable. Right. They're like, oh, no, it's all it's all Spider-Man this time. Yeah. And it seems like they're kind of trying to separate it in kind of a cheesy way. Yeah. And actually, the further it got away from superheroics, the more I liked it. My yeah. favorite stuff in the movie was when it was Peter Parker, high jinx on his class trip, mm-hmm. him and MJ. I thought that storyline was was really well played out in that movie. So, I don't know, I guess I wanted a coming-of-age <laughs> Peter Parker movie. Yeah. I mean, I, I also, <laughs> I love the whole uh, roman- romantic relationship between, uh, what's his, uh, his friend's name? Uh, Ned. Like, Ned, yeah, right? Ned. I like the whole thing with Ned and his girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was great. That was fun. That's it. All that stuff, that, that was the stuff I loved. Yeah. You know, I would have liked more of that. But I guess, I guess it's a superhero movie, so someone's got to punch someone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think another thing I, I really like about the these Marvel movies in general, besides the -the over-the-top time travel and, you know, Thanos stuff. Right. I think uh, they do a really good job of making you feel like all the the technology components is actually realistic in our universe. Right. Which I think is kind of cool because you can kind of picture this stuff happening. Yeah, even all the Thor god stuff. (laughs) They'll make offhand remarks of, uh, yeah, science always seems like magic if you don't understand how it works. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, well, maybe the Thor stuff is a little over the top, but yeah, and the yeah. Doctor Strange stuff. Yeah, that too. Yeah, it can all well, be I'm explained talk- by nanotechnology. I'm talking about the technology <laughs> elements, Component. right? Right. Like the nanotech. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nanotech solves everything. There you go. You know, you no longer need to watch a superhero put on his entire costume. Right. <laughs> you just press a button, and it goes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Which is pretty cool. All right. So Spider-Man: Far From Home. We both give it what a D plus. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I would I would give it a B B minus. Give it a B. B. Give it a B. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So we walked out of Spider Man Far From Home. You had a big grin on your face, and I said, I want to wipe that grin off your face. <laughs> I want to see some tears. Yeah. I want to see you shaking your boots. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want these boots to shake. Yeah. <laughs> so what did we do? We saw Midsummer, the latest horror film, the second film. From Ari Aster, known for Hereditary, another hit. I don't know if it was a hit, but it was definitely critically acclaimed. Uh, So Midsummer, what did you think of Midsummer? (laughs) 
I mean, it was fine. I yeah. thought the begin. I mean, I think similar to you. I thought mm-hmm. it started out very intriguing. Mm-hmm. Um, but once I start, once I could tell where the story was going, I felt like I've already kind of seen this before. Mm-hmm. You know, at first it seemed like, oh, this seems a little original, right? But then. At a certain point, I knew where it was going, and they felt like they were just showing us the same thing over and over. Mm-hmm. So overall, I enjoyed it. If it rare for me, if it was shorter, I think it would have been better. Right. Usually, I wish a movie is longer. We should say this is a it's it's a horror film. Yeah, it's two and a half hours long, mm-hmm. and I would say the first sixty to ninety minutes I thought were great. Mm-hmm. They were even purely from a film, uh, from a technical standpoint, some of the choices he made, where to put the camera. I remember the first five minutes of the movie. There's a shot where it's uh, it's it's from the sky. You have a shot of a city, and there's a phone ringing. Every time the phone rings, the camera cuts closer. It rings again. It cuts closer, mm-hmm. and you're sort of zooming in on the house where the phone is ringing. And even that, I thought, man, we're in for we're in for a wild ride yeah. if uh, we're gonna have interesting stuff like this and there was a lot of things like that throughout the movie but part way through without getting into spoilers you do start to piece together i kind of see where this is going certain things happen which made me feel really detached from the story and for the last hour and a half i was kind of last hour hour and a half maybe i was kind of like this is a little intriguing it's kind of somewhat interesting but I, i'm kind of waiting for it to end now i was kind of bored by the end yeah i, I kind of feel like this movie did the same thing a lot of horror movies do, which is they try to seem original and unique, and then they end up falling into the same trap that all horror movies right. fall into, where at the end of the day, it's like, okay, it's just like all these other horror movies I've right. seen. I mean, I don't know the answer to that necessarily, but, yeah, you know, it, like, it reminds me of Cabin in the Woods. Yeah, like, yeah. It was, it was super unique, and then it ends up being exactly what they're trying to parody. Right. We're going to subvert your expectations by seeming to subvert them, <laughs> but then do the expectations. Yeah. Basically. That's perfect. <laughs> you all understood what that meant, right? <laughs> I get it. <laughs> uh, I will say, oh, one more thing we should say about Midsummer. It was a pretty hilarious movie. It was which funny. It was surprising going in. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, I, the characters in this movie seem oh they're so they're aware of the situation Mm -hmm. like they're aware of how weird everything seems it's funny to see them react to it yeah but then at the same time you're like okay if you are aware of how messed up this is why are you still here (laughs) (laughs) there was okay without getting too spoilery yeah (laughs) there is a situation where somebody is invited to go on a trip by one person who's in the group that's Mm -hmm. going on the trip and you can kind of tell everybody else doesn't really want that person to go. Just hit a little close to home for me because I just went on a trip <laughs> <laughs> to, to Greece where I was invited by one friend. And then during the movie, I was like, wait a minute. What if I was the friend and they didn't really want me to go? Uh, I'm, I'm sure they were all happy to have you. Yeah, it was very yeah. believable. They should have put a trigger <laughs> warning on that movie. <laughs> uh, and then just one more thing about Midsummer. Um, <laughs> Ari Aster, the director, I, I'm... Even though we had a few complaints about the movie, I think he's an amazing filmmaker. I can't wait to see. Whatever he does next, I'm going to be fully on board to see it. I agree. I, I like this movie enough to mm-hmm. see what, what else comes from him. Right. And he actually had a Reddit AMA recently, and he said he's probably going to step away from horror for a little while. He said he's interested in making a full-on comedy next, and I mm-hmm. think he's, he's shown he can pull it yeah. off. Well, there's a lot of crossover between the horror and comedy genres <laughs> you're laughing because you've heard me say that yeah. a bunch of times <laughs> it's true you always have these comedians like isn't chris rock producing the new saw yeah yeah, yeah he is he is yeah. yeah i think he's going to be in it as well yeah yeah he's uh, actually it's funny you mentioned chris rock i also just read that season four of fargo chris rock is going to be in that and uh jason reitman's going to be in that as well so just speaking of comedians crossing over into uh hmm. other territory so, Very interesting. Yeah, I thought about bringing that up for today's episode, but since neither one of us watched Fargo, <laughs> wasn't going to. <laughs> you don't watch Fargo? I watched the first season, thought it was awesome. I started the second season, I thought it was even more awesome, but then I got really busy at work. <laughs> and it's one of those shows that's so dense, if you walk away for a while, it's hard to just pick up where you left off. 
So at some point, I've got to go back and rewatch season two. Especially now that you have a YouTube channel where people expect you to talk about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have to <laughs> sometimes for a show like Attack on Titan, for example, I have to do a lot of reading. And like, if you see my wall, it's covered in papers and string. I'm trying to figure everything out. <laughs> All right, I was, we're going to go a little out of order here because uh, this is just relevant now. We talked about subverting expectations. <laughs> <laughs> what expectations were just recently subverted in the last 24 hours? Well, I wouldn't say they were subverted <laughs> because it's not surprising <laughs> that this happened. Right. So what happened? So uh, <laughs> Benioff and Weiss, who people have been calling D&D for a while, David Benioff and what's his name? Is it also David? I think so, yeah. All right, Benioff and Weiss, <laughs> the showrunners of Game of Thrones, were going to appear at Comic-Con, uh, and uh, they decided not to yep. because of scheduling conflicts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so just man-to-man, -man. <laughs> do, you, do you believe it was scheduling conflicts? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Before the finale aired, they were asked in interviews how they were going to handle it. And they basically said, when that finale airs, we're going to go to a cabin far away <laughs> with a lot of alcohol, stay off the internet for a while. And I have a feeling they just crept out from under that rock and they were like, ah, never mind. I'm good. <laughs> going back to that cabin. Yeah, we're going, we're going back to, uh, I'm picturing like Patrick Starr. He lives under yeah. that rock. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. I don't really know. I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of. I'm okay with them not being there. I don't know if I need to see people. I, mean, I think if they were there, I think it probably would have been fine. Maybe one or two people would have asked questions where they were like, "Why'd you do it? Huh? Why'd you? Why'd you do this? Why'd you do this to us?" <laughs> I, I mean, I think they're making the right decision. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Listen, would, I, I think one day, years from now, we'll start hearing some of the actors maybe talk, giving some honest opinions. I don't right. know if we'll ever hear from D&D. &D, yeah. But eh, it's okay. I don't blame them. I think, I mean, I blame them for what they did. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't blame them for not talking about it. I don't need to hear anything from them. I think it's, yeah, it's I'm fine, good. whatever. I mean, anyway, uh, a year or two from now, once we're, in the th once we're in that theater and the lights shut off and Star Wars comes oh. on, <laughs> we'll say, you know what? It was all worth it. <laughs> I, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I never cared about Star Wars as much as I cared about Game of Thrones. Yeah, though. and for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, Benioff and Weiss uh, have been hired to create a trilogy of Star Wars movies. Mm -hmm. We don't know anything about what they're going to be about, but well, we many... know it's going to be about Knights of the Old Republic. Uh, I actually, I think they announced they're developing a Knights of the Old Republic film, but I don't think that's the one Benioff and Weiss are doing. There's a bunch of Star Wars movies in development. There's also Ryan Johnson, who directed Last Jedi, has also been slated to create a trilogy. <laughs> so there's a, there's a lot happening in the Star Great. Wars universe. <laughs> yeah, I, I can tell you're excited. <laughs> That's my goal in, the, in one take. My big goal is to find a thing that you're excited about. <laughs> <laughs> one day. <laughs> All right, so let's, uh, let's talk about... So speaking of things <laughs> that you're not excited about, uh, Terminator... Dark Fate. So there was a featurette released, 90 seconds, a little bit of new footage in there, and they peeled back the curtain a little bit, yeah. revealed some information. Uh, so are you now, this, now, you saw the trailer, yeah. you were like, meh, you saw this featurette, are you now excited for Dark Fate? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm a little bit like meh still, but mm. I, you know what, I do think I'm excited enough to yeah. see it so far. I, I, I'm going to wait for some reviews. Right. But I would say if it's over uh, 60% on Rotten Tomatoes, I'm, I'm willing to go see it. Okay. All right. I've actually lowered my bar for Rotten Tomatoes. Really? Pretty Well, so I watched... Uh, I've always been intrigued for some reason by Rob Zombie as a filmmaker. Oh. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I just, I, I, I've, so, I've seen trailers for his movies, and I always feel like they have a little bit of an interesting aesthetic. I think he usually tries to make them look like throwback 70s horror movies. But anyway, recently I watched House of a Thousand Corpses, mm -hmm. his debut film. Which I remember it came out when I was in high school, I think, and I really wanted to see it. So 16 years later, I finally made it happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that movie's sitting at like a 23% on Rotten Tomatoes. Hey, I thought it was all right. So I've kind of rethought my whole philosophy on Rotten Tomatoes. You know, that's a valid point because... 
I love Ninja Turtles one and two. I love Mighty Ducks. Yeah, and those have awful reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Exactly. So and it's definitely not because of nostalgia that I love them. Having <laughs> having said that, yeah, if Dark Fate doesn't cross the sixty percent barrier, <laughs> I don't know if I'll see it. But okay, yeah, I want to hear you say something good about Dark Fate though. There was one sequence in the featurette that you were like, okay, yeah, I like that. Uh, was it when mm-hmm. she said, uh, what'd she say? Uh, I, I'm, I hunt Terminators. I hunt Terminators, <laughs> you metal motherfucker. Or yeah. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, obviously it's a little over the top, but, you know, yeah. it's fine. I, I can picture Sarah Connor ending up like that. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, she was basically already like that in Terminator 2. Yeah. She'd already become a badass. Yeah. Now she seems to have even more confidence in her abilities to do so, though. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, but remember the scene with the machine gun with Schwarzenegger? Oh, okay. That's yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, that was awesome. He, he just close close range. That's what it's called, right? Close range. Close range. Just shoots a machine gun right at that Terminator's face yeah. <laughs> and just blowing his. All the flesh all off the, his face. The, yeah. That, <laughs> that was, was awesome. Cool. Uh, what do you think about Arnold Schwarzenegger? Uh, it's called Carl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's cool. I'd love to see just, you know, Carl roaming around town. Yeah, exactly. To be human. <laughs> so I have to pat myself on the back here because if you go back and watch my review of the Dark Fate trailer, I theorized that the Schwarzenegger robot Terminator in this movie was placed in a cabin to basically hang out there for a while in case one day he's needed. And I think I heard through the grapevine, because they screened some footage at Comic-Con, the featurette they released online, that was only some of what they showed at Comic-Con, I believe my theory's been confirmed. And in fact, Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator, he hangs around town, and people have taken to calling him Carl. (laughs) I'm hoping there's a really funny scene of him just walking around town shopping for groceries yeah. acting normal <laughs> he's like picking up baguettes yeah he's like <laughs> he's like sylvester stallone in uh in creed where he's like running the restaurant yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's got like his glasses on he's like counting inventory <laughs> yeah. if that's in it um i'm giving it 90 percent. we need least. to order more baguettes <laughs> <laughs> he's got like employees <laughs> He's like, oh, I don't want to be a Terminator. <laughs> if only one day I could taste the food I create. <laughs> These Terminators don't have taste buds, I'm assuming. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that'll be explored in, uh, in Dark Fate. Okay, but there was one other piece of news that I was really excited about. And as always, when I'm excited about something, you got to get your bucket of water out and rain on my parade. Uh, <laughs> you get your wet blanket uh, Edward Furlong John Connor the kid from Terminator 2 he's back he's going to be in Dark Fate James Cameron casually dropped that bombshell in a video message at Comic Con that's cool Yeah, <laughs> I, I, that's cool I like it I love it I'm so excited <laughs> about that because Edward Furlong he's on the list of people where every, I don't know, a couple of years, I, th- I think to myself, I wonder what happened to that guy. Well, no. I, sorry, go no, ahead. Then I read the Wikipedia article, and I always thought, like, I wish Edward Furlong would come back to Terminator. I remember when Terminator 3 came out, I think. Everyone was asking, is he going to come back as John Connor? And then I saw all these paparazzi pictures, and I was like, yeah, I hope he doesn't come back as John Connor. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wanna, you know, who I want to see come back is John Connor's friend, from the beginning of Terminator 2. You know, the guy from Salute Your Shorts? Is that what he's in? Or oh, no, Pete, Pete, Pete and Pete. Pete and Pete. Yeah, yeah I want to see I want to see where he's at. Yeah. <laughs> they just kind of forgot about him. Yeah. yeah. You figure John Connor would. <laughs> you know, why isn't he friends with him anymore? You, you're so hard to please. Like <laughs> James Cameron is, uh, is at Comic-Con. He's like, we're bringing back Edward Furlong. You're like, boo, what about Pete and Pete? Yeah. <laughs> the, guy, the, the person we all really care about. Yeah. He helped him hack that ATM and everything. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's well, that's right. pretty much all John Connor. That kid just watched. They should do, so the same way they did Cobra Kai, yeah. the Karate Kid <laughs> sequel series where it's about the bad guy, do a sequel series where it's about that kid. Maybe that's what Pete and Pete is. Pete and Pete's in the same universe. Oh, wait. Yeah, yeah that's my theory. Wait, what? Is that not what your theory was? No, it is my theory. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which came out first. 
Uh, Terminator would be my guess. Terminator 2, because that was 91, I think. <laughs> I don't know. These are the insights <laughs> you tune in for on one take. All right, what are we talking about next, Delon? Oh. Uh. Memories, <laughs> all alone in the moonlight. I was really hoping you'd join in there. We could harmonize yeah, for a second. No. Nah. But okay. I think everyone knows what we're talking about based off that, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah, moving on. <laughs> no. So, okay. What, what the hell was that, Alan? Why did uh, I just sing all of a sudden? That is a song from the musical Cats. That's right. And Cats is, uh, it was a Broadway show, and they're doing a, a, a film directed by Tom Hooper. He does all kinds, he does musicals. That's like his thing. Uh, he actually did Les Mis, the uh, live. I don't know why. I don't know why I keep having to stop myself from saying live action. Like, <laughs> did anyone think it was going to be animated? Um, so he did Les Mis, which I was actually a pretty big fan of because the Les Mis musical did something that most musical adaptations don't do. Most musical adaptations they film everything and then they dub the music in afterwards, and it gets that kind of fake studio polished feel. Les Mis, they recorded everything live, like right there on set. So I liked that. So I went into Cats, you know, with high expectations. <laughs> Not really. I, I don't even know, to be honest, what the Cats musical is about. Do you know what it's about? Cats. It must be about memories, <laughs> is my guess. <laughs> um, what'd you think of the trailer? <laughs> <laughs> Just it looked weird. <laughs> that, the aesthetic of the live action kind of CGI. So for those of you who haven't seen the trailer, <laughs> uh, in the play, they wear cat costumes. In the, in the movie, they basically use motion capture to do these humanoid cats. Yeah, it's odd just seeing celebrities we know, but it's like the cat version of them. You right. got Taylor Swift, you got James Corden, uh, you got uh, Idris Elba. Oh, Ian McKellen. Ian McKellen. I think there was another. Yeah, I forget who, but... They all look very happy in the trailer. They do look so very happy. That's, <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> yeah, I guess I don't have a lot to say about this one. It just I, I was mildly curious what they were going to look like. And it, I don't know. I didn't like the look of the cats. It just looked weird to me. I'm going to have nightmares about those cats. Yeah, tonight. honestly. It looked like it would be a hard sit. Let's put me. up a picture. Okay. All right. <laughs> there we go. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if this one crosses the 60% barrier on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> uh, if it, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Um, it mm. also had a new trailer. And uh, first off, the, the, the first It, what did we think about that movie? I really liked it. Yeah. One of the better horror movies to come mm -hmm. out in a, in a while. I remember really, actually, kind of similar to my take on Spider-Man. I think I liked the non-horror stuff the best, where it was yeah. just the kids hanging out. And uh, the horror stuff was great, too. But even that was harder for me to appreciate, because one of the few books I've read is Stephen King's It. And that book was so dense. And it, it, in the movie, they split it, right? The first movie is the kids. The second movie is the adults. The book went back and forth and did a lot of interesting things with the cutting back and forth. So, you know, it's, it's hard to watch the movie and forget about how great the book was. But um, I, I liked it. It was great. Mm -hmm. Been excited about the second one. And I don't know, this trailer looked like it's very in keeping with the tone of the first one. Uh, I, I like that there was a lot of the kids in the trailer. So it seems like some of the cutting back and forth that happened in the book, they'll bring some of that element into the sequel. And... Yeah, I'm excited for it. Me too. Anything to add to that? <laughs> if it gets higher than a 60%, <laughs> I might check it out. Yeah, I, I think uh, this movie I'll see no matter what. It, yeah. That's probably... I've already seen the first. I want to see how the story ends right. in the new movie. Yeah. And I think the, the casting for this movie is like perfect. Yeah. James McAvoy, he looks... So, I'm a big fan of his. Yeah. And they didn't really do right by him in Dark Phoenix. Yeah, and that, who's that, that comedian that plays... You know, that's Bill Hader. Barry. Bill yeah. Hader, perfect casting yeah. for that character. See, comedy and horror crossover constantly. Yeah, I told you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jessica Chastain. Yeah. She we be. think the, uh, the actress, the kid actress, was like, I hope Jessica Chastain plays me. <laughs> I don't know if she knew that she was going to or not, but ever since she said that, it was kind of like that would be perfect casting. And then she is that character yeah. now. 
So, okay, we're psyched about it. Um, have you ever heard of um, a little service, a little web service called Netflix? Yeah. <laughs> so how many subscribers do you think they gained in the U.S.? <laughs> Uh, this past quarter, I don't know. <laughs> One, they didn't gain subscribers in the what? U.S. They lost one hundred thirty thousand. Why? And globally, they only added two point seven million, and they thought they were going to add like five million. You thought with Stranger Stranger Things season three? Yeah. yeah. This is what I think happened. This this is punishment. Uh, right? <laughs> you think you could take my favorite characters, Daredevil, Punisher, and Jessica Jones, Iron Fist to a lesser extent, Luke, Luke Cage. Cage. You think you can just get rid of them? No. This is what <laughs> happens. I don't think that's what happened. But Netflix themselves, they said, we think it's due to not having a great slate of original television and it's too expensive. Seems like a reasonable opinion. Right? I mean, <laughs> what, the service is too expensive? Yeah. Well, they kept increasing the price. Yeah. <laughs> but it's funny. They don't mention, I guess, all the competing like subscription services. Well, they probably don't want to mention that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they don't want to bring your attention over right. to those. Hulu, HBO. The, the thing is, all those services have been around for a while. So I don't know what suddenly changed. Mm -hmm. You know? But I don't know. <laughs> House of Cards is gone. That could have been it. I, I don't think that was it. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So I guess I don't feel too bad for Netflix. I think they'll be okay. Um, all right. Here's a news story that I really care about, that I'm excited about. Not that I didn't care about the other ones. But <laughs> you know Quentin Tarantino? Yeah. One of my favorite filmmakers. I'm assuming one of your favorites. Yeah. He... Uh, a year or two ago, there was a bizarre news story. One of those news stories that every time you hear about it, you say, no, that's not, that's not a real thing. No way. <laughs> Apparently, Quentin Tarantino pitched a concept for a Star Trek movie to J.J. Abrams. And they liked it. And they said, yeah, we want to do this. We want Quentin Tarantino to make a Star Trek movie. Hmm. And supposedly, one of Tarantino's stipulations is... I want it to be R-rated. And they said, yeah, let's do it. So we keep hearing about it every once in a while. Now, one thing is uh, Tarantino has consistently said he's only going to make 10 movies. Yeah. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which comes out in about a week, that's going to be his ninth film. Mm -hmm. So people have been asking him lately, if you make this Star Trek movie, I mean, does that count? And he's like, yeah, I guess like I could... You know, use it as a loophole and be like, it doesn't count because it's not my movie. But he said, no, nah, I think I should stick to my guns. If I make this Star Trek movie, and I'm not saying I'm definitely going to, but if I do, that's my last movie ever. I don't want his last movie to be a Star Trek movie. I know, exactly. And <laughs> I mean, I, I st I, I'm still intrigued, right. but I don't want it to be his last. I want to see a Tarantino Star Trek movie, but if it's going to be his last, I'd rather he do something original. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, and, and they've asked, so there is a, a little bit of, uh, of news on the movie. So he, it's still not confirmed. What he basically said is, I've been keeping my head down, working on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I've been busy. Once I get out of this, I'll go back and I'll talk to, to those folks and um, see what's going on and see if we can make something happen. Uh, there's also a couple quotes here I'll read from him in a second. Uh, actually, I'll just dive into those right now. So first, they asked him about the R rating. And here, I'm going to try and do my, my best Tarantino impression. <laughs> Deadpool showed that you can rethink these things. Do them in a different way. That doesn't sound like Tarantino. <laughs> or I'll do it in my normal voice. Deadpool showed you can think of things in a different way. So really, even before J.J. knew what the idea was, his feeling was, if it wants to be an R rating, fine. If it wants to be the wild bunch in space, fine. So it sounds like he has total creative control Whatever happens, happens. I get annoyed at Simon Pegg. He doesn't... I can't do the Tarantino voice. I was really hoping I could pull it off. I had a great Mark Hamill impression on the last one. So I wanted that to be like a regular thing. I get annoyed at Simon Pegg. He doesn't know anything about what's going on. He keeps making all these comments as if, as if he knows about stuff. And by the way, that's something I noticed. Every once in a while, there'd be a news story 
where people would ask Simon Pegg about the Tarantino Star Trek, and he would comment on it. But apparently everything you said has been nonsense. Okay. So, Tar- <laughs> <laughs> so Tarantino goes on. One of the comments he said, he's like, well, look, it's not going to be Pulp Fiction in space. And then Tarantino <laughs> says, yes, it is. If I do it, that's exactly what it'll be. It'll be Pulp Fiction in space. That Pulp Fiction-y aspect, when I read the script, I felt I have never read a science fiction movie that has this shit in it, ever. There's no science fiction movie that has that, has this in it. And they said, I know, that's why we want to make it. (laughs) It's, at the very least, unique in that regard. (laughs) (laughs) I never thought I would see a Tarantino peg uh, conflict. Yeah, I know. (laughs) (laughs) And the other thing to pick out there is, he said, when I read the script. So, I guess that means somebody else is writing this movie. Which is another thing. If it's going to be his last movie, I, I don't want it to be the first movie where he's directing someone else's yeah. script. I, I, I saw, so one of Tarantino's first movies was True Romance, where he wrote the screenplay, somebody else directed it. I'm a little bit more okay with that because mm-hmm. I think Tarantino's writing is so awesome. I love his directing too, but if I had to pick between directing someone else's work or someone else directing the work he wrote, basically what I'm saying is I, I want I him to write it if he's going to make it. <laughs> yeah. So, excited for it. I really don't want it to be his last movie. (laughs) Same. One thing this reminded me of is that when I was a kid, I would always imagine that one day technology is going to be so good with machine learning and algorithms. Eventually, there'll be like an entertainment system where you can just say a movie you want to see and it'll produce the best version of that movie possible and show it to you. So I could say... You know what? I want to see what would happen if Rocky Balboa had to fight aliens. And I want to know what it would be like if that was directed by Steven Spielberg. And then this machine would produce that movie and I could watch it. <laughs> this feels like one of those things. Yeah. Where I could be like, okay, Star Trek. And the machine's like, okay. I'm like, no, no, okay, all right. Directed by Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> Do you want it to be written by him as well? No. Surprise me. <laughs> Do you want it to be rated R? Yes. NC-17. Whoa. R. Let's go with an R rating. All right. That's a lot of stuff we just covered there. Yeah. What was your favorite one? Your favorite story? Favorite news story? Uh, I think that last one. Because I didn't know about that. And I am intrigued. Yeah. Hey, we did it. We found something you're excited about. Oh, well, I mean, Tarantino. Right. I'm going to be excited about anything by him. So you're excited about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Absolutely. All right. Awesome. I love that part where Leonardo Di- DiCaprio <laughs> is doing that little like dance. That. <laughs> yeah. I will show that right here. I noticed uh, <laughs> that's funny because I re- that reminds me of the Joker trailer. Mm. Robert, Down- uh, Robert, Down- nah. Robert De Niro does the same dance. Oh, yeah, he does. Yeah. yeah. We'll put up a clip side by side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be one of those quick bait YouTube videos. Yeah. <laughs> we compare the Robert De Niro's dance from the Joker to we compare that to Leonardo DiCaprio's dance. That's a really long time. Once upon a time in Hollywood. <laughs> you won't believe what we found. <laughs> it's a six hour video. It's a loop. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go ahead and watch it again now. This time in slow motion backwards. <laughs> Five hours into the video, it's like Yo, is everything okay in there? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm going to watch it again, though. (laughs) This is a very special episode of One Take. (laughs) Okay, I think that's it for One Take today, right? Uh, Yeah, that was pretty good. All right, well, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon Mm -hmm. so you get notifications whenever we make more videos like this one. And thanks for watching.